I think, um, no, one up more, Bill. Up, backwards. Yep, nope. Hope, the rest, there you go. <clears throat> Interesting song for Christmas. Uh, I just really like the Gettys. He writes, and she writes, they write modern hymns. And uh, so these are all new things that they're doing. And they're writing where we're all at. And I think this is incredible because I look around and I listen and I, I hear a lot of hopelessness. I hear a lot of mundane living. Christmas time, time of joy. Has everybody got the joy with them today? How's your joy meter? Here's full. Yeah. Here's, here's empty and here's some of y'all that don't want to admit it. You're bottoming out. You're going through the bottom. And you know what? That's a shame. I think it's a really shame. We sing things like this. My hope rests firm on Jesus Christ. And if you're, if you're, man, if you're down to here, man, if you're here, if you're, if you're not really here in your hope, it says that your focus is wrong. It says that we're not focusing on the right thing, especially, man, Christmas time. And I know, man, the rush. And Gloria and I went and did some last-minute exciting Christmas shopping yesterday. It was incredible. We were in and out of the store. I, I wanted to stick around a little bit. Can you imagine that? I knew I needed to have my brain examined, but <laughs> Gloria's going to take me to the doctor, psychiatrist. <laughs> because it, it, it was like, wow, I can't believe we were in and out so quick. But we were on a mission, and we were excited. There, and there's hope. And there really is hope. And so when we sing songs like this, don't just sing the words. Man, if your hope meter is down, you know, he is my only plea. Plead to him. Plea and say, man, Lord, I'm in, I'm in some bad shape right now. Uh, I need you. Though all the world should point and scorn, his ransom leaves me free. And you know, we need to remember that. We're free. We, we can be free from the power of darkness. Now, we might not be free from all the pain, as George said, you know, the, the thorn in the shoulder thing. We might have some physical pain. We might even be carrying some emotional pain. But, you know, we have a place we can take it. We have a place that we can go. I find it's kind of, God gave me a, a, just a, an idea for some sermons. Uncommon. Uncommon. Uncommon truth we looked at last week, and I had a different sermon already written, and boy, throughout the past couple of weeks with the funerals, you know, three funerals in, three mo- in one month, it, it'll wear you out, and, and it weighs on your heart, and uh, as I thought about that, I said, boy, we need some hope, and when I, Shane and I were talking, I said, I, I have this idea and an outline that I started putting together, uncommon hope, and then I'm sitting there on the pew, and Gloria's doing the the advent story and she talks about bethlehem now and and the kids did a good job bethlehem is the city that jesus was born and i just got another title i don't know if i'll do it this year because i pretty much think i know what i'm doing but you know what bethlehem means bread it's bread and so there's another title for a sermon uncommon bread Un- think about that. We have an uncommon bread. We have the bread of life. You're going to go to the store and you're going to be eating bread today and maybe have some for your lunch, you know, and it's not going to fill you for the rest of the week. But we have an uncommon bread in Jesus Christ that we can go on and on. Well, getting back to the sermon, we're going to be in First Peter. <clears throat> Children get excited at the coming of the season, and, and as I said, I was kind of excited yesterday. And often we might feel a bit of a, a charge through experience, their amazement. You know, we kind of go along and we watch them bubbling and everything and just excited about what's going to happen. Usually kids are gift-oriented because that's what Christmas tends to mean to them. We are the ones that are responsible to help them have some more of a view of that. But the measures we go through to provide for them are often the very things that rob us of knowing the wonders of Christmas for ourselves. We plan parties, we trim trees, we max out our MasterCard, our Discover cards, and our Visa, and some are doing all three. Uh, you know, and, and then February comes and the bills finally come. We get all, have you been getting mail? Defer your house payment for a month. That's a great idea, isn't it? 
But then you got to pay more interest, and you still have to pay. It's not, there's no free money out there like that. We, we kind of think that way when they send us those things. But, boy, when Christmas is past, man, then we have the pre-holiday blues that creep in because we've overdone. And so we get ready for Christmas. We wrap, we ship, we wrap the dolls, we take the trip. And that's assuming that we aren't the ones, uh, one of the multitudes, as I said earlier, and, and you identified, that carry the Christmas blues. So here's the thing. If Christ coming into this world offers hope, and hope, as the song, O Holy Night, says, provides a thrill, how do we locate the experience? How do we get the thrill? Isn't it, you know, we sing about that. The angel said, peace and joy. But where is it at? Why is it Christmas time brings out so many of the other and usually the negative side of emotions? The distractions, the delusionments that come along with December. When Christ came to the earth as a babe in Bethlehem, he came to the world that was without hope. Well, you know, we live in a world pretty much without hope again, don't we? And it seems like we need to really focus on the hope of Christmas, the hope that Christ brings. So he brought an uncommon hope. In the rest of O Holy Night, the first stanza, O Holy Night, stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till something happened. Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. I hope that in today's message and in today's worship, I hope that you will find that bright and glorious morn. I hope that you will surrender, give up, throw it away, give. Man, Paul, Peter says, cast all your anxieties back to Romans. Which altar are you going to be at today? The world's altar or the Lord's altar? Which one will you be at this Christmas season? Man, if you're at the world's altar, I guarantee you're going to feel hope and dis- or hopelessness, despair, and disillusionment. Because the world doesn't have anything to really offer us. But if you will stay at the, the Lord's altar, I guarantee you will find hope. Because we all need that hope. Hope's a precious commodity in human life. And what a contrast of emotions between hopeful and hopeless. Isn't there a contrast of emotions there? It's like black and white. Man, I mean, totally total difference between the two in the bible it uses both ideas so today i hope to unwrap Uh, it was a part of the other part of the theme that the lord really hit me with last sunday night as we are unwrapping the hope of christmas unwrap what god offered in jesus christ is only begotten so i find it interesting when you start a sermon like this you need to define some terms and i think since we're talking about the world's altar kind of and the lord's Well, what does the uh, world say about hope? The world defines it as an emotional state of feeling which promotes the belief in a positive outcome related to events and circumstances in one's life. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? Until you spend a little time thinking about feelings. How are your feelings today? How were they yesterday? How were they when you ate that nice dinner? You kind of got to feel a warm fuzzy and your, your feelings went up. You see, the problem with feelings is they fluctuate. Man, they are up and down. And if our hope is just strictly feelings-based, man, our hope's going to be up and down too. There's nothing to ground our hope in. <clears throat> hope according to Daniel Webster. If you never looked at the Daniel Webster 1827 Dictionary, go online or go to the library and borrow, look at a Daniel Webster Daniel Webster's the one that him and his family that have developed the dictionary. And Daniel Webster was a Christian. So what you get is a Christian view, a Christian worldview of definitions. He says, hope, a desire, uh, the noun aspect of it, a desire of some good accompanied with at least a slight expectation of uh, obtaining it or a belief that it is obtainable. Hope di- differs from wish and desire in this that it implies some expectation of obtaining a good desire. Hope, therefore, always gives pleasure or joy, whereas wish and desire may produce 
or be accompanied by pain and anxiety. Boy, I desire this or I want that and I don't get it and I'm down in the dumps. Life's not any good anymore. I'm back to the worm state. You know, woe is me. He continues, though, he gives another definition under the noun. Confidence in a future event, the highest degree of well-founded expectation of good hope. Listen to that. The highest degree as a hope founded on God's gracious promises. That's where hope needs to be founded on God's promises. A scriptural sense, a well-founded scriptural hope in our religion, the source of ineffable happiness. And he still continues, and they'll be up on the wall there again. That which gives hope, or that which furnishes ground of expectation, or promised desired good. The hope of Israel is the Messiah. You see how I like Daniel Webster's dictionary? Because, man, you get a Christian perspective, you know, and, and here's the guy, the people that put the dictionary together. They wanted us to have hope. We used to have a Christian worldview. A biblical worldview, which is really the best way of viewing it. And Daniel Webster, that dictionary really helps us with that. And then he says, the Lord will be the hope of his people in Joel chapter 3. Daniel Webster also gives Bible references for the, the reasons for definitions. And then for a verb, hope of good success, be sober and hope to the end, First Peter 1. Hope humbly then with trembling pinions, Soar. Are you soaring yet? <laughs> you see, man, when we have real hope, when we have the hope of the Lord, man, we should soar. He wants us to mount up on the wings of an eagle. He wants us to soar. And here's my favorite saying. You can't soar with eagles if you're hanging out with turkeys. Amen, Amen. Amen brother. So get out of the turkey-based living and get with the eagles of the Lord and soar. To place confidence in, to trust in, with confident expectation of good. Psalms 43, 5 is the, the verse he puts with this, and this is an uh, English Standard Version translation. Why are you cast down, O my soul? David writing. Yeah, David got cast down. You know, all of the people of God have been cast down at one time or another, but do they stay there? And he continues. And why are you ter in turmoil within me? Anybody in downcastness, a little turmoil in your heart today? Okay, here's the answer. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. David wrote in Psalms 40, The Lord has heard my cry and lifted me out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a solid rock, and he gave me a new song. Some of us have been singing the old song way too long. You know, you know how it goes, don't you? Woe is me, woe is me. We sing the woe is me song. I've been there, been there. I hate the term been there, done that. i just been there. <laughs> and I don't want to be there no more. So I want to be a, 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 a used to be of singing the pity party song. Ephesians 2.12 describes the terminal hopelessness uh, condition of the sinner as remember that, remember, remember what you used to be, okay? Don't be there anymore. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant promises, having no hope without God in the world. Man, that, that's a, a used to be. If you're there today, ask the Lord to help you get out of it. Help him, ask Him to help to raise you out of that miry clay to set your feet on that solid rock. Colossians 1.27, on the other hand, describes the hopeful repentant sinner. So an unrepentant sinner, repentant. If I, you know, He commands us to be grateful. Do you notice the command? He commands us to be of good cheer. And you know, if we're not there, what is it saying? Saying that we're kind of wallowing in sin nature, aren't we? We're kind of wallowing in a hopeless God. And, and that we don't want to hear that sometimes. What it really means is we're out of focus. Sometimes you take a picture and you want it a little bit out of focus for a little weird skew to it. But most times, if you're going to have a wedding, and, and I know they're going to want it, especially I know Julia wants her pictures in focus. Hey, you know, give me a good, nice, focused picture and, and something that's crisp. 
And that's where we need to be. The hopeful. They experience the reality of the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What's the mystery? What's the hope of glory? Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Don't lose sight. Christ is in you. He hasn't left you. I don't care if you're going through the long, dark night of the soul. I spent many, many a nights there. He's not left you. Because he says, I'll never leave you. And that's a promise. And if he left you, how do we believe anything he ever said? So he's with you. He's with you right now. Colossians 1.23 assures the repentant person of forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. If indeed, there's an if. And so let's look at what that if is in our life. If indeed we continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope. You see, the if is don't get moved away. When it says in Hebrews 10.35, don't throw away your confidence, that's what's happening. We're kind of forfeiting it. We're kind of giving up. And we're letting the world and all those worries and whatever else is there crush in on us. And we get again get hopeless but he says and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation not just to you all creation under the heaven for which i paul was made a minister throughout god's word throughout his word we find god offering hope to mankind and you go to the very beginning i did i wanted to find it i want to see okay where does hope really begin well, in the beginning, God. Well, there's hope right there. If I went no place else in the beginning, Elohim, the name that he uses, God indicates that he had everything that was ever needed to create anything that's ever needed. And that means he has everything that you need because he's the creator and he loves you. So you go all the way back to there. But then it says uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and, in, and I will put enmity between you and the women. Man has fallen, Adam and Eve have sinned. And between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Satan's the enemy. He will do everything he can, not only this holiday season, but every day, every holiday season yet to come, that he can to confuse you, to cause you to feel hopeless, uh, to have you follow his evil way. The phrase, you will strike his heel, man, is re referred to Satan. He's attempting to defeat Christ, but all he can do is strike his heel. Christ strikes his head, and that's a head blow, and that's a fatal blow. Man, we have hope. Evil has been conquered. Boy, all the negative aspects of evil have been conquered. I need to put my hope in Christ and, and watch how he will work in my life to continue to lift me up. And there we see our hope. Hope that once again we can have intimacy with the Almighty. So let's unwrap this gift of hope. Uh, you have a simple outline. because It's really a pretty simple message. Uh, long introduction. We're turning to 1 Peter where he unwraps this hope, describing it in four ways. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at different verses as we go, so we're just going to read 1 Peter 1, three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, it's always through Christ or in Christ, with Christ. It's always that phrase, that, and this is a living hope, that he's talking about. Blessed be the God of our Father. Man, he caused us. Man, when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he caused you to be born again to a living hope. Man, not to a dead hope, not to a, a futile life, but to a living hope through Jesus Christ. Man, I have to keep coming back to Christ. I have to keep my focus on him. Lord, what, what do you have for me today? How do you want me to live today? Lord, be my strength today. Lord, I kind of woke up on, you know, the proverbial wrong side of the bed. Anybody else ever get there? Like me? <laughs> proverbial, because, you know, there's no wrong side of the bed. There's the wrong side of my mind. <laughs> and, and I get up and I either haven't had enough sleep or 
the world's not moving according to the life of uh, Chris, and, and we call that the wrong side of the bed. A living hope in Christ. I must focus on him. Peter opens this letter by establishing the basis of hope. That's the resurrection of Christ. We sing, Because He Lives. Great song, 407. Man, here's just a couple of the words. Because He lives, I, or we, can face tomorrow. You see, you've got to have that imprinted on your mind. Maybe you need to have it on the dashboard of your vehicle, on the mirror. You know, when you, you look in that mirror, well, yeah, you better have because he lives. May he make me look better today. <laughs> because he lives, I can face today. Because he lives, I have a living hope. And I can face today because of him and because he gives me a living hope. Not because of what I'm done, because, you know, I find everything that I do is usually... You know, not up to par unless I'm doing it for him. Because he lives, all fear, and I put in, can be gone. It, it, the song says all fear is gone. But I know that that's not necessarily always a reality for us. You know, the fear can be gone, you know, facing surgery. You know, and I'm thinking, they told me the other day how messed up my shoulder was and, and what it's going to take. And I've been waking up at night thinking, man, Lord, you know, I've had way too many surgeries. Uh, I'd really like to make it through this surgery. I'd really like to have a little more time with Amanda and Glenn. And I'm really hopeful, Lord, that one of these days, you know, we'll have grandkids. I'm, I'm hopeful for those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, Lord, I, I need to give you this fear. I need to give you the, the concern for another surgery that I have. All fear can be gone. And then I go back to sleep and I wake up and I, I kind of remember I talked to the Lord about it in the middle of the night and then I just got to go on with life. Because otherwise, you're underneath it. And let us add, because he lives, our future is guaranteed. You know what? Think about this. Sean and Julie get married. Your future is guaranteed. As long as you live it in Christ. Did you hear about that? Man, we can salvage every marriage out there as long as we'll live it in Christ. As long as I get out of my own self and live it in Christ. Because he's a living hope. You see, we need a living hope for Christmas. It's an uncommon hope. It doesn't fade away. It's uncommon. It's there for us. But folks, if we don't unwrap this hope, we're going to be finding all sorts of things to fall short of. We're going to find life's not working the way I want it to work because I'm missing out. It really needs to be working the way he's ordained it to work. John 14, verse 19, the last part of it. Because I live, that's Christ speaking. It's red lettered, I know that. <laughs> I know it because he said it. Because I live, you will live. And if you ain't living, you're, you're allowing yourself to beat down, to be beat down. You've given up the living hope, and you're following something dead. And we need to get out of that and get on with the real hope. Christians enjoy salvation because of God's abundant mercy. He gave it to us, and because of His mercy, we enjoy a, a, a living hope, an eternal hope. Because Jesus rose from the dead, He didn't stay in the grave. The hope does not expire. Isn't that good news? Man, it's not like my Visa card. I wish it would expire. <laughs> Man, my hope doesn't have a date on it that says expires like my driver's license. Well, you're only good for eight years. And then, oops, sorry, you screwed up. Let me get out my, my ticket book. Oh, you were mad at your wife how many times? Oh, oh you talked to your husband this way? Yeah, yeah, sorry, no more hope. I punched out your hope card. It doesn't say that stuff, does it? Man, we have a living hope that's an eternal hope. And it goes on and on. Without a Christ, a person doesn't enjoy that. And they have that sense of hopelessness. And, and they can try, they can want, and they can get. But look at the Hollywood stars. Man, they've got it. they got most of them, all the money they could really want. Well, maybe not want. They, they have women and men, and, and they swap back and forth all the time trying to find somebody else that's going to make them feel better. We're so into looking for something to make us feel better that we, even as Christians, miss that we already have the feel better in our lives. That's the living hope of Jesus Christ. With faith in our Lord Jesus, we have great hope. We have an exciting expectation. Is your expectation exciting? Do you have any? Do you expect anything good to come out of today? 
Did you come to service and say, man, I hope the pastor beats me up today? Yeah, man, I need a good, I need to be. Well, you might need that. <laughs> you might need the two by four, the proverbial one upside the head. But I know nobody came here looking for that. You came here hoping to hear a word of God. And I'm trying the best I can to present the word of God that he wants you to have a living hope. And if it's not there, then drop everything right now and answer his invitation for a living hope. And it's simple. I can even pray to keep my eyes open. Lord, I need some living hope. Lord, I've been following some of the wrong things in life. Man, I've been under the, the, the pressure, Lord. Would you give me some living hope in Jesus' name? Because see, then there should be some amazing expectations. What do you expect for the rest of today? What do you expect for tomorrow? Man, I'm, man I am so looking forward to uh, the 22nd of this month. At total expectation. Man, and Glenn fly in late at night. Whew. I ain't looking for late at night, but I'm sure looking forward to them coming in. I'm looking forward to having them home for a while. And I'm looking forward to Shane and Julia's marriage and, and for their future. I have an expectation for great things for them. I have an expectation for you. I'm, I'm expectation for Kathy's dad that he's going to come to know the Lord as Savior. I expect that because I have a living hope and I've seen what God can do after 15 years and Kathy's mom turning to him. Man, that's hope. Otherwise, I'd be thinking, well, ain't nobody going to come to the Lord. I, just, I don't know why I preach anyway. Ain't nobody going to feel good when they leave here. Everybody's going to be in the dumps all day long. <laughs> man, oh man, you know, you shoot me and put me out of my misery. Because <laughs> that's certainly not what we want. Man, the Christian rejoices because they have endless hope. Endless. Man, that should make you want to give some God some whoop of glories. Woo! Watch out, get a little charismatic on you. <laughs> It'd be all right. It'd be all right to have some endless rejoicing. Well, there's some more. Roman numeral number two on your outline. There's a focused hope. Verse 13. First Peter, verse 13. Therefore, gir look, at you've got to take some actions here. Maybe you missed this today when you got up or this past week. Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Folks, man, we've got to fix our hope daily. Daily we have to fix it. Now, I, I mean it, you know, maybe you need to put because he lives, I can face today. Maybe that's a good thing. It's a reminder. It's not a mantra. It's a reminder that I have a living Savior, and because He lives, I can face today. Because He lives, line two, I can have an endless hope. Maybe I need to have that when I, on the ceiling when I open my eyes up. And, well, no, I'd never see it. I have, maybe I need to have it on my glasses because I don't have glasses on when I wake up. I don't see anything. But maybe that's what we need to do on a daily and more important, on a moment-by-moment -moment presence of the Lord, uh, who tells us that He will never leave us. Nothing can snatch us out of His hand. You know, you see the young martial artist, and you know the master comes, and he says, Oh, grasshopper, take the coin from my hand. And grasshopper does that, and the master goes there, and the coin's still there. You know? And Jesus said, No, nothing can snatch you out of my hand. Nothing. Nothing can snatch you out of God's hand. And nor can any created thing separate you from the love of God. Man, it's, it's an endless deal. If you have given your life to him, you are there. You just got to remember it. And you got to move forward in it. He'll never leave. Nothing can snatch you out. And he's preparing a place for us. Whoa, check it out. He's preparing a place for you in heaven. Man, oh man, Glenda, Vivian's daughter, she got to see that place. Belle got a vision of it, I believe, before she died when she said to Jody and I, man, I think the place is going to be beautiful when they finish it. The building's going to be beautiful when they finish with it. And that there's no building going around any place that Belle is at except in heaven. Kathy's mom's there, and she's saying, whoa, I thought I had it good before. Chew, this is it. <laughs> you know, she'd be excited. And they'll be excited to see one another. And sometimes I get a little jealous because I like to be there. But he says, you can have a vision today. 
of what it will be like by living in me with a living hope and not being stuck in the mundane where you tend to be sometimes. I'm preparing a place for you that where I am, that you may be. You see, he's trying to stimulate our hope. He's trying to stimulate it so that we will not be beat down so often. The verb hope is a command. It's a command. So, man, he's commanding us, fix your hope commanding us to fix it on him. And it means that Peter exhorted believers in a military fashion to a decisive kind of action. Decisive. To hope that is an obligatory act of the will, not merely an emotional feeling like the world describes it. See why I don't like world descriptions very often for biblical context? Man, because it misses out on what it truly is. We are to hope to the end, which means that we are to set our hope completely and fully on the grace which we receive in the revelation of Christ. Man, folks, we need to know Jesus. We need to be reading the Word because He is our living hope. And if we're not in the Word, then we, we, we have so many other things feeding us. You, know, you think about what feeds us. You know, Our kids go to school for six to eight hours a day, and then they go home and they watch TV for three or four hours. What's feeding them? Man, and the world sense of hope is the, tends to be all too often depravity. And, and it's on things. Man, look at the way people acted on in, uh, the day after Thanksgiving. Hate to learn the term Black Friday. But, man, people got trampled. A woman went to the store with mace, pepper spray, sprayed 15 people to get a toy. I gotta t- I'm here to tell you what. There's nothing in the store that I need that bad. Nothing. But if you fix your hope on that... If you fix your hope that if I don't get that for my child, I am a worthless, no good parent, you're stuck. And you will be stuck for a long time because they'll continue to want those other things. And we set them up. And we have our our focus on the wrong thing. Christians are not to hope half-heartedly and indecisively, but with a finality, without any doubt concerning the promises of God. They're real. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, it's up on the wall. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait, look what we're waiting for, the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, we're, we continue to hope in him. He's going to come. Man, you know, we were talking about that the other night at dinner with Evans and Cora and Gerald. And, you know, man, every, every generation of Christians, Paul and them, man, they thought, sure, the Lord's going to come in our time. Man, but the Lord's working in lives. He doesn't want any to perish, and he's willing to continue that on. And I want to get on the business getting these people saved, man. I want to get home. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of in a hurry to get home to Jesus. So, man, we, we've got some things to be about. For the Christian, the best is yet to come. And, and that's the thing for my mom and my dad who waited, you know, my dad until, you know, well, it was a couple of days before he died when he accepted Christ. Kathy's mom, a couple of days before she died. My mom, it, it was about a year or so before she died that she accepted Christ. And I think, oh, Lord, that they could have had so much more. And the Lord says, yeah, they got the best is yet to come. Don't worry about what was. Let's get them to where they need to be. And then let's have hope. And let's see what the Lord's got for them in the future. That's an incredible thought. With certain hope we have that Christ is the best. And the best is yet to come as we go to be with him. But there's another kind of hope that Peter talks about. And it's a secure hope. Verse 20. uh, 20 and uh, 21, the last part of 21. For he was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. For through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Man, we have a secure hope. They're in the God that nobody can snatch us out of his hands. Man, he's all-powerful. He's Elohim. He's almighty. He is the, the Lord of hosts. 
and you continue to look at his names, those are characteristics that he wants us to know. That's, I don't know, seven, eight years or whatever ago when I preached through the names of God. Man, so we'd get a picture of God so that we would know those, those names that he has given us, those character traits that we can hold tight to. God the Father has shown his complete satisfaction with Christ's work of atonement by receiving him back into his presence, and he crowned him with glory. And every believer, according to Ephesians 1, 6, is accepted in the Beloved. Man, every one of us is accepted in Christ because the Father has ordained it. And if you're going to be consecrated to the Lord, you need to develop your relationship to Christ day by day. Boy, we have how many days left to Christmas? Today is the 11th. You have 14 days left to Christmas. You have 14 days to establish yourself in the joys of the Lord. I mean, if you just looked at it that, that way, you have 14 days and then you'll celebrate the culmination of a 14-day journey of hope, of hope. But you've got to get in the Word to do that. And, and and look at those promises, see what he has to say. Boy, if you don't have a concordance, man, borrow one from the church. And, and, and look at that to see what he has. Because he wants us to have this living hope. Unfortunately, all too often we stop unwrapping the gift of hope, isn't it? All too often we kind of fall short. We stop there and, and we get unfocused and, and we miss on the many blessings that the Lord has for us. Man, keep unwrapping the hope. Keep unwrapping the gift. Keep digging deeper into the Lord that we know him, that we know this living hope. To stay on a firm foundation, which is Christ, you need to continue that unwrapping. Otherwise, you'll lose sight of it. And then there's a fourth there's a challenging hope. A challenging hope. Chapter 3, verse 15. Chapter three, fifteen, verse 15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. From the opening words of chapter 1, Peter has emphasized the living hope for the, of the believer. The unbeliever, they don't have that. They don't enjoy that living hope. Uh, they're not connected. And, and so in reality, their lives are empty. A life of spiritual darkness is what they have. And, and we have the light. We, and, and you know what? According to this verse, people should be able to see the hope that's within us. They should see that hope. And we need to reflect that out. Man, so if I'm down in the dumps, you know what's not only affecting me? It's affecting everybody around me. So that's at home. That's at work. That's at school. That's wherever I intersect with people. Man, if I'm down in the dumps, I'm not showing them a living hope. And I'm not reflecting Christ out of my life. But sanctify yourself. Boy, sanctify yourself in Christ. The challenge is twofold. One of the distinguishing marks of believers is the possession of hope, and therefore our daily lives should attract enough to cause people to wonder about that hope that we have, to notice the difference. And that's a big thing, that they notice the difference. You know, if they notice the difference, people tend to ask you, what's with you? How come you're so happy? You must be getting married. No, <laughs> that's a shame. <laughs> Why are you? What? What are you so happy about? Man, I have a living hope. A what? What's a living hope? You know, what do you do? Put fertilizer on it? I mean, that's how I would. I, I would. I'm, I was rotten when people say things. I would wait, put a little fertilizer. Well, matter of fact, I do. I go to the to the living water. Living water. What are you? What, what are you talking about? You've been getting iceberg water or something? See, just think of what people might say. Oh, no, man, the living water I have is far greater, more oxygen than that iceberg water. What are you talking about? Well, let me tell you. You sure you want to know? Yeah, well, look, I asked you the question. Would you just come on and tell me? I, you sure? Because you're going to think I'm a little weird. I already think that. Well, you're going to think I'm weirder. And then they finally say, yeah, tell me about it. Man, I have a living hope because I know Jesus Christ is my Lord. And say, oh. Oh, man, you're one of them people. 
Yeah, and you notice the difference. And the hook is set. You, you just set the hook in them. Now can I tell you about the living water? I'd like you to have that. Because it seems you don't have that living hope. And I'd like to offer it to you today. And that living hope only comes from one place. From Jesus Christ. Set, reeled in. Not me, the Lord. You see, that's what he offers people. And, and, and he challenges us to live out this hope that the world might see it. Christian hope is to be so real, so distinctive, that people are puzzled by it, and that they'll then give you that opportunity. I told you many a times, the greatest track i ever seen produced, and we have some still, is, uh, here's hope, Jesus cares for you. Here's hope. I, I think it's phenomenal, because it has roadmaps of hopelessness. There's this town called Depressed. Some of you have been there. I've been there. There's this town over here called Hopelessness. Been there. And you look at these names on this kind of has a map on it. And you see all these depressing, you know, and we know we've been there. And then you open it up and it says there's a place of power. And that's Jesus Christ. And then as that road map unfolds, you find hope. You find joy. You find peace. Isn't it crazy? It's a wonderful track easy to use because i ask people sometimes what do you do for hope and when they tell me ah, there ain't no hope man i jump right in the middle of that and if they ask me what's the difference in my life that gives me an opportunity to try to explain to them a little bit and with today's message looking at hope i can talk to them i got a living hope yeah but there's too much month at the end of the money i know man i know been there done that but i got a living hope and then we, you continue to move on with people. These words suggest that the believer should approach others carefully and kindly when you look at what Peter's saying here. Man, approach them with care. Let them know you care for them. Let them know you're concerned about them. Everyone probably has somebody in their life they know that's lost, have intersected in, in the highways and byways of your life with somebody that's been hopeless. You know, if that's the case, and I, one of the other things that I might do is say, you know what, I have to apologize to you. What for? I remember when my dad said that to me once, and it was not over spiritual things. And I said, what for? And he said, well, you remember when. And I was back being a 10-year-old boy, and I remembered when. And he apologized for something he had done to me when I was 10. Man, I can, I can say to people, you know what? I got. I want to apologize to you. Well, what for? I haven't shared the living hope that I have. And and watch what they say. And if the door opens, walk through it, because the Lord's with you. He's the one that's going to guide and direct, not me. The great gap between hopeless and hopeful has been bridged by the saving grace of Jesus Christ, whose promise is our blessed hope. And that's what Titus two thirteen told us. Little wonder that the shepherds rejoiced over the message of the angels. Why? It was a message of hope. Man, they didn't have much hope in them days. We don't have much today. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 5, reading from New Living, be up on the wall, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Isn't that great? The living hope in Christ will not lead to disappointment. And if we're disappointed, we're out of focus. Because it will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves him. Why don't you write your name in your translation? For we know how God dearly loves Rick Thomas, Joan, Gloria, Joel, Sean, Vicky, John, George, Kathy, Margaret, Shane, Julia. Whew, I'm on a roll. Bonnie, Keith, Caleb, Richard, and, and uh, Bill. And then Krista. And Sandy are doing a show this morning. So that's why they left. And there's a living hope. He loves you. He loves you. And if we just write that in our Bibles, if we put that under, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I have a, a living hope. Man, because he dearly loves me. And write the verse down. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And then back to Psalms 43, verse 5, New Living. It seems to have lost sight of the hope. The, the psalmist, when he writes that, Why am I discouraged? 
Different translations I like to read and give you a little bit different uh, perspective. Why am I discouraged? Lou Living says, why am I downcast, O my soul? (laughs) Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And then he refocuses and he says, I will put my hope in God. You see, when you're out of focus, man, those are the, the call signs of being out of focus is we're discouraged and we're sad. Same, we're out of focus. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. So let me ask you, where's your hope today? Where's your Christmas hope? Is it all wrapped up in a, in a box someplace and you forgot to unwrap it? Get it out. Man, go home and, and have your spouse or have a friend ask somebody, would you wrap a box for me? What? I just need a box wrapped up. And then open that box with a fury and let hope pop out. You see, maybe we need to have something to demonstrate it for us. I really was going to do that, except I looked to get a program of a gift being unwrapped. It was They wanted me to pay $10. And there is no way I was going to pay $10 to put that up there. You go home and wrap a box yourself. And then you open that thing up. And if you want it to be really good, put in the box, big letters, gothic, hope. And then when you open it up and you get your gift out, you got the gift of hope. Is that absurd? I hope not. I hope not. I hope that we will do whatever it takes to focus back on the Lord. That this Christmas season will be unlike everything else we've had. That it will be Christ-centered, not gift-centered. That it will be hope-centered because I have a living hope from an almighty God who says, I love you. I love you. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do come before your throne of grace and mercy to praise your holy name. I thank you, Lord, for the living hope. I thank you, Lord, that you offer that living hope to all people, all places, all times. And, Lord, I ask your forgiveness for when I'm not living out that living hope and the world can't tell the difference between me and them. Oh, Lord, renew and refresh our spirits. Lord, if we've been in that long, dark night of the soul, if our joy meter is is pegging down low, Lord, uh, renew us. Lift us up on the wings of those eagles. Oh, Lord, lift us up. Take us into your sanctuary and cover us, Lord, with your wings. Strengthen us, Lord, that we might know we have a living hope, that we will leave this place, that we will walk through, Lord, this next 14 days with a living hope beaming bright. Boy, have a a Rudolph nose beaming. Jesus lives and I have a living hope. And, Lord, not only for 14 days, let it go on every day that the world may know that we have a God that lives. I'm not sure where you're at today. Man, if, you, uh, if you've been down, I'd suggest just coming and praying. Kneel down before the, the altar of God. You can kneel where you're at. You can do anything as long as you're before the right altar. Man, don't go to the, to the world's altar. It will leave you empty. But go to the altar of Almighty God who laid down his life for you to give you a living hope and ask him to renew it in Jesus' name. As John plays, will you take this time to talk to the Lord?